everybody, and welcome to Adventure. Uh, joining us today is Ian Kaneshiro. Uh, Ian is an e-commerce vet living in sunny Tel Aviv, leveraging his decades worth of experience in the world of e-commerce, um, helping Amazon sellers navigate the nitty gritty of managing pricing strategies on the marketplace. And when Ian is not hosting his podcast, because that's not intimidating at all to interview a podcast host um, or helping sellers, he can be found chasing a disc with his ultimate Frisbee team or chasing his dog, Nala. Uh, so welcome, Ian. Thanks for joining us today. Jeanette, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so the burning question that I have for you, and I'm sure the one thing that all of our listeners want to know is what kind of dog Nala is. Uh, yeah, that's a great <laughs> one. Uh, great question. Nala is, she's a mix. She's a mutt. Um, in... As are we all. As as we as we are, yeah. So in Israel, they have um, there's like this local dog that's mixed interbred with every other kind of dog possible. It's like the dog of Canaan, or what we call a Kanani. And okay. so she's uh, she's a Kanani um, golden retriever mix. So I will have uh, to Google that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of that. Yeah, uh, that's like, but I'm sure she's a good girl, right? Of course, she's a good girl. Uh, yeah, she's. <laughs> She's more or less a house dog. She gets along uh -huh. with the family, but outside, um, she can be she can be tough to handle. Little, but she's a little socially so anxious. <laughs> a lot of socially anxious for sure. <laughs> so before we launch into the questions, um, you know, typically when we have folks on here, their journey is pretty similar as far as how they got into e-commerce, and then it kind of takes a left turn somewhere. So, just you know, give us a quick summary of how you actually got into e-commerce. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. You know, when it's funny enough that like my e-commerce journey probably started when I was 14 or 15 years old. Um, I was actually working a summer job for um, a fam in a family business. It was actually a cousin by marriage his family um, had a company called Sports Section, a couple of locations in uh, in Southern California. Um, and they had an e-commerce business, which had transformed previously from a catalog business right wow. um and that's so that's a leap that's a big leap it's a it was a big leap and you know that was even before i joined them so they had the catalog business they had a brick and mortar and then by the time um they brought in you know a younger cousin for uh, for a <laughs> summer job i was i was working in the warehouse um you know pulling orders from the pulling orders from the shelves and the different batches um, during the during the holiday rush, I was you know working returns, and um, and during the in between times, whenever I had a break from school um, or or baseball practice, I was working with and I didn't realize this at the time. I was working with their their Amazon guy, essentially posting, creating listings, um, mm -hmm. and and selling items that didn't have enough to to make the catalog or or make the website, and selling you know. Um, selling these like one offs or closeouts here and there. So um, okay. it's really so it's really funny that I was in that space for for many years. And then this cousin actually they actually sold that um, sold that business. Um, my cousin Greg, who I'm, I'll give a quick shout out to Greg. Hold on this. <laughs> okay, um, we'll have to make sure he listens. We'll make sure that he listens. <laughs> So, so Greg actually moved on to a different e-commerce business that worked in kind of um, more of like the lingerie space and kind of, you know, this was big time for raving. So raving Halloween costumes, things sure. like that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I worked in the art department there. So it was really interesting, like in high school and or my college years, I was kind of doing this summer winter break part-time job for these companies and then um you know you fast forward after college i moved to israel started working in high-tech sales and um i kind of found myself working for seller snap the you know as at seller snap or an amazon repricer and it i really started to make those connections of oh i used to be here and right you know, but i'm on the other side of the coin speaking to sellers who are running companies similar to the ones that, you know, I was working for part time. So it was like this really interesting connection of saying like, oh, I can actually, when you're, when they're telling me stories about the warehouse, I can actually picture and I can picture myself there <laughs> at a really young age. And that was, you know, 10 years later. That is, that's a young start into this sort of landscape. I think one of the most interesting things that you've said and uh, kind of poignant is that how much things have changed since then. So you started out in this brick and mortar space and um, online, or I'm sorry, catalog marketing. 
and you know fast forward to 2024 and we have everybody starting out with online sales and then mm -hmm. wanting to diversify to email marketing and brick and mortar stores so it's really taken you know the flip i think um and you know surely amazon has had a lot to do with that yeah um, most uh, most definitely i think i think what what the real what the real change is is that the barrier to entry is so much lower um you know in the past 10 years of of amazon and shopify and and everything in between that mm -hmm. it allows people who normally wouldn't have the opportunity to you know pull together a ton of money open up shop and buy a ton of inventory in order to, right. to sell it right. a really um direct path to a customer base right because that's what yeah. amazon that's what amazon brings to the table for amazon sellers is 100%. the eyeballs on the listings which is why you know ultimately amazon sellers pay the the referral fee or the commission for right. that for that marketing purpose but it's the barrier to entry is so low um you know comparatively you speaking it's a lot higher today than it was you know say back in 2015 when you could enter you know amazon for a few thousand dollars i think now the stats are like you know kind of like 50k um is a good baseline to like really enter and, and be strong in it but compared to operating a brick and mortar store and all of the overhead that goes in to that sure. and your limited market i mean the, the literally the world is your marketplace on amazon so yeah relatively speaking it's very low entry yeah and i think you know the 50k mark is is what i hear as well in turn when we're talking about you know building a brand using a private label product right. but in turn if we're talking you know if the the arbitrage space forget the wholesale you definitely need a little bit more money up front but the arbitrage space you know you hear stories of people starting with a few thousand dollars you know um you flip that and you can and then you can start really moving so if you're not paying yeah. if you're not taking a paycheck you know if you have a thousand dollars of of goods you're making 20 30 percent if you're making 30 percent on that that's uh, that's what 300 bucks that you can reinvest, reinvest in, yeah, and keep absolutely. and keep on build, and keep on building and so that, and so I think that's what I mean when we're talking about the barriers to entry being really low mm -hmm. is that depending on which you know kind of Amazon path you choose whether it be the arbitrage path the wholesale path or or private label or starting your own brand yeah, there that's a good is, point. there's a path for for everybody who are coming in at different price points that's um, great with, that's great advice accounts, yeah yeah it is important though to reinvest that whether it be in advertising or more product or expanding mm -hmm. your product line brand building all of those things so for those that kind of don't know um i'm going to just kind of start at the beginning and we'll work our way up explain what is repricing and why it's important in the context of online retail specifically on platforms like uh, amazon sure absolutely so what is repricing the first before i get into what is repricing the what we what i really like to jump into is why is it necessary and like what is what is the buy box because the buy box is connected directly to repricing yeah and absolutely so for, go for it and so for anyone who has never actually most people listening to this probably have been on amazon <laughs> but um if everyone wants to take a moment and you know you think about um, an amazon listings page the last product you look at on the right side of the screen on desktop and if you're looking at your mobile mobile device about right at the bottom of the screen you have what's called the feature offer where you can click and add something to car or buy it now that is the buy box and when we're talking about selling items that as a third party seller that other sell, other third party sellers can sell essentially everyone is trying to compete to be in the buy box at the time that the customer clicks buy now or add to cart so when that purchase is made it comes from my inventory and not somebody else's mm -hmm. and so essentially what amazon does is that they have an algorithm that sets the what they call the the best offer um into the buy box and so the best offer is looks at pricing and it can also look at you know logistics um you know if you have if you're prime if you can deliver if they can deliver in two days it also looks at ipi scores or your performance index and um and because as amazon wants to be the most customer centric company Absolutely. on the planet yep. they are looking to put give the best customer experience by putting the best third party seller into the buy box mm -hmm. But when we're talking about logistics and IPI scores, oftentimes, you know, there's not a huge variation between a lot of between a lot of sellers. And in the moments that there are not huge variations, the the thing that they'll go to is price. 
Gotcha. And so, um, and so what a repricer does is that we adjust the price in order to um, put the seller in the best possible position to win the buy box and capture that sale when the customer clicks buy now or add to cart. Yeah, that's virtually impossible for a seller to do on their own, right? I mean, how could you possibly know what that algorithm is going to do? How close you are to being that best price for the buy box, right? Right. And it's and, and it's not so there's a part there's a portion of that where we're not talking about knowing what the algorithm wants and and feeding it the right information, but just the the simple fact that if you are selling a an item where you mm -hmm. have other competitors competing for that buy box, that that your competitors are likely using a repricer as well. So if you are not using a repricer, then you are already a step behind because yeah, we're looking at you know um, at you know these different performance indicators, but but even but we also have to take into account that if my item is an FBA, then my logistics are the same as all the other FBA competitors. Right. And if and if um, I have a competitor, even though you know we're not privy to the the these performance indicators from all all of our comp all of our competitors, if I have a competitor that is constantly lowering the price even if they have these lower performance indicators like a, a lower score they are highly likely to win the the buy box because they are providing the best customer experience with the lower price and the f and the, uh, tagged onto the fba logistics as well um well let me ask you this do customer reviews uh figure into that that algorithm at all yeah so it's a ranking great, it's a great question yes yeah, so um we often find that um customer reviews not just the rank of reviews, like how many stars um, a seller has from the customer reviews, but also the number of reviews uh, do get involved, like do take a, do hold weight in mm -hmm. the Amazon Amazon uh, algorithm. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it's not something that you can control in the moment, right? If you are not winning buy box, it's not like you can go and gather a few thousand reviews to beat this competitor that's in the buy box, or you can, if you have, you know, four and a half stars that you want to get to 4.7, you can't do that, you know, in a moment's notice. And so right. repricing is really the only thing that sellers can tangibly do right now to better their chances of competing for the buy box and winning. So this all happens in flight. This is all dynamic. Yeah, this is super dynamic. You know, um, repricers, whether it's us or one of our competitors, um, we are plugged into Amazon's um, SPAPI, and we are grabbing all that data from Seller Central via the API and making those decisions on the fly. Wow, that is some some tech that goes into that. I would imagine uh, most definitely, and you know, <laughs> it's um, and I think what it what it boils down to is you know aligning the the different technologies that are available to mm -hmm. you know the individual goals of the seller the seller yeah itself. it's interesting i've heard it compared to uh like a credit score you know everybody knows what uh factors contribute to your credit score but the actual way that they calculate it is this big black box because yep. you don't know how much weight each factor carries and they just kind of shake it up and they're like here you go and I kind of feel like winning the buy box, I've heard it compared to that in a little bit. Like we know what affects it, but we just don't know what weight everything has. And the the other, that's actually, I've never heard that before. And it really, really tracks. And I think that the other thing that's really interesting about that is that we also don't know when Amazon decides to, to change this over you know, over the past maybe six years, uh, I've been with I've been with Seller Snap. We see these different behaviors from Amazon, in, mm. you know, in all these different ways. Oftentimes, because it's a black box, just like your credit score, sometimes it's unexplainable. You'll we'll be looking at a listing and we'll say, why Why is this competitor winning over us when we're a better price? And then we can make assumptions that it's because of the reviews or number of reviews, for example. But all we can do is make that assumption and mm -hmm. and then again in the moment in the moment we have to focus on pricing while kind of a more of a, a medium or long-term strategy for the seller is focusing on getting the reviews up um you know staying in stock so we don't have a negative impact on our ipi score and everything in between well let me ask you this now that we're sort of getting into this 
Number one, do you think it's accurate? Do you think that Am Amazon's algorithm for awarding the buy box is is fair? And number two, as a follow up, do, would you want to see it be more transparent? And how would the, if it were completely 100% transparent, how would that affect the marketplace? Wow, tough questions. The first question, well, well, let's unpack it step by step. The first question, do I think it's fair? <laughs> I think that there's, I think that there's a level of, I would like to believe it's fair. Yeah, but Amazon understand. doesn't listen to this. You could be yeah, totally yeah, transparent. <laughs> for sure, for sure. No, I, I, I just want to be thoughtful about my response because yeah. I, I, I do think that in terms of fair fairness, there is a a level of fairness when we're talking about seller seller third party seller to third party seller. You know, if you if you ask me as a consumer, do I think that a third party seller with more review with more reviews and better reviews and um and the same price should be winning over a brand new seller that has mm -hmm. less reviews uh, lower ratings yeah probably they provide a better customer experience right mm -hmm. the thing that we also have to remember is that amazon also often competes on these listings and i think if we're talking about you know competitive behavior or anti-competitive behavior it's really easy for amazon to say Ah, oh, we of we as Amazon obviously provide better service than any of these three party third party sellers, so we are going to award ourselves a buy box. Right. And so you know, I and I think from that from that point, I don't have any you know concrete evidence, sure. but understanding you know who Amazon is, being you know the largest retailer on the planet, I can imagine that there's some things built in where they might be leaning on you know yeah. their their own businesses, even though mm -hmm. they're often operated as separate business entities, they still want each entity to um, succeed oh, in, all, in, their, in their own ways. It's all so, part of their flywheel, right? That synergy. Yeah, most definitely. So um, in terms of in terms of fairness, I think that there are points where it is likely very fair. And there are definitely points where it is probably where it's super unfair. Um, right. and, it, and it just kind of depends, you know, what categories you're in and who your competitors are. Um, so what do you think? What do you think if it was 100% transparent, would that uh, affect competition in the marketplace? Do you think that would create sort of like a monopoly on on certain products or categories where brands have been, you know, established and not really allow for new folks to enter the marketplace? Interesting. So we're, so like we're asking a question that, you know, in terms of transparency of me being able to see the metrics of my yes. competitors and myself? Well, not necessarily, but um, if Amazon gave, say, a score um, to every factor that they weighed uh, in on or that, I'm sorry, that factored in on, um, you know, winning the buy box. So, it's, you know, price, uh, customer reviews, XXX, and each one had, you know, sort of like a score so that you knew, um, what you would have to focus on to win that buy box. Yeah, yeah, I really love that question. I think that if there was a bit of transparency on what, it, you know, and it, this could likely change, you know, from year to year or even quarter to quarter, that Amazon says this quarter, first quarter of 2024, we're focusing on sellers who can maintain um, an in-stock ratio of X. In Q2 2024, we're focusing on sellers who have high ratings and low ratings. Because, and I think that would provide an opportunity for sellers to kind of be introspective, you know, focus on areas of their business where they might be lacking and maybe and make them more competitive in the marketplace. I think that's a I think there's something really interesting there. Cause again, you know, when we're talking about when we're talking about seller snap. And we're talking about how we interact with sellers. You know, sometimes we see situations that, from a from what we find as a logical perspective, doesn't make sense. We are not <laughs> winning buy box when we think we should be. Right. And yeah. How the, frustrating. And it's fr and it, it's frustrating for us because we want to be able to support our sellers in in the best possible way. But sure. sometimes, but because it is a black box, like you said, we when we don't have the answer, it, it there are times where we have to tell sellers, you know, we don't know, and the best thing that we can do is still just try to compete on price. Whereas if we had a bit of transparency, we could say, you know what, we do see that this item in question 
was out of stock for 70% of the month in the previous month, which right. dropped your score, which dropped this score by this. And that's why you might not be winning the buy box right now. Yeah, I think we've just come up with a brilliant, uh, a brilliant plan that we need to present to Amazon. You heard it here first. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. You know, we can uh, we'll bring it up with Jeff in our uh, in our next roundtable. Oh, sure. Perfect, perfect. But you know, that's a great segue into my next question, which is, what challenges do sellers face when implementing repricing strategies, and how can they sort of overcome these challenges? Obviously, using Seller Snap is one um, opportunity that they can take part of um, to overcome some of these challenges. Yeah, yeah. So. When we're implementing um, repricing strategies, there are so many different um, there's so many different things that sellers need to think about. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is we often need to think about what is the optimal you know return that we are trying to make on a given item. You know, so we look at our we look at our cost of goods sold. We look at all these kind of other the fees that we pay Amazon and these kind mm -hmm. of what I will refer to as you know fringe costs we're talking about we're talking inbound shipping we're talking yep. ad spend um and and everything in between right and so the the first challenge is taking into account all of these things that we spend money on right and then making sure that we are setting a minimum price at a point where when i make those sales i can cover all my costs right it's and so important and it's super super challenging because some things are pretty straightforward. I know that an item costs me this much money. I know what my fees are, uh, but then there's all these variable costs that come into play. We're talking, you know, long term, long and short term storage fees. We're talking this new low FBA uh, low inventory fee. We're talking this new, um, you know, inbound sh shipping placement fee, and we didn't even get started on on payroll, a lease for a warehouse on the keeping the lights on quite literally and all of these things have to be built into that padding between you know your your costs and the price you sell it for and make sure that there's enough to to cover all of that and so right. i think that's like that's the challenging um that's like the first of the challenging things that we need to really think about yeah do you find customers that are just obsessed with the buy box at any cost Absolutely. And I think, and I think that that's the second, um, I think that's the second part um, that is super, super challenging. The way that, and, and, I'll, and I'll take a step back just to give a quick, a high level overview of like how SellerSnap works and why, why I say that this is challenging. Because mm -hmm. bas basically what SellerSnap does is we take a cooperative approach to capturing the buy box because we understand that being aggressive will lead to things like price wars where we undercut each other really bottoming out the price and that yeah. cuts into again our margins right and that's the stuff that pays the bills what's what's challenging is that sellers um, at all different points need to oftentimes like to say i want all of my listings to reprice like this but the fact of the matter is each one of your listings is living in its own you know micro competitive environment it, it has it has its own competitors. Um, it has as different pricing, different inventory levels, and um, and making sure that you are setting the right repricing strategy with the right min and max price at the right time is mm -hmm. is super complicated because there are going to be some times where you know when we're using our AI to uh, take a cooperative approach that is probably the best thing that we can do especially with new items because we're selling items at a um, at a higher average selling price higher average win price for the buy box but on the flip side when we're talking about items that have high inventory age you know when inventory age starts to hit that 90 day mark or the 180 day mark we have to start making decisions that about you know do i Maybe pay to store item. it or yeah do i pay to store it or do i liquidate it? it right depending on the size of my company as well i also have to make the decision you know if i'm having cash flow issues i it it hurts it hurts so much to have inventory tied up in um in amazon's fba system and forget like these these horror stories that you hear when <laughs> items are taking a long time to be checked in i'm talking about items where you have an opportunity to sell and you're not selling because 
you want to do you want to do something do do something special but essentially that money is just sitting in amazon's yeah. warehouse and costing you right. more that's the key the costing you yeah yeah so it's a cash flow issue and it's a higher cost issue so that's also super challenging on um what repricing settings do i use and when so it sounds like you have to walk a really fine line between having kind of a bird's eye view of your entire business ecosystem taking into account all of those costs but also at the same time when you're looking at repricing kind of honing in and focusing and kind of almost acting like every product that you have is the only product that you're selling at that time yeah yeah i would say that's a that's a fair um that's a fair statement you it does know? not sound easy to do it's not easy to do <laughs> and, that, and that's why you know when we're talking about you know, seller snap as a repricer and also as a data tool, we often have to make assumptions on, you know, what I might refer to as, you know, groups of listings or, or buckets in order to set a specific strategy to a specific type of item or group of item. Because part of the reason you have a repricer is the automation because you're not going to go and do it all day, every day. You can't do it 24 seven or even pay right. someone to do it 24 seven. But on the and on the flip side, we want to make sure that we are, you know, making decisions in a logical way on on a more macro level in order to minimize the amount of nitty gritty decision making that we have to do. So you do a bit of testing and then you apply it to a subset of listings. And if it works, you you keep building on that. If it doesn't work, you move on to something else. And then, so it's just like anything else in business. There's a bit of trial and error. There's a bit of A-B sure. testing um, in order to um, ultimately find what's right for your business in the moment because we know that, you know, this month it's one way, but next month it might be completely different. Oh my goodness. But it sounds like what you guys do is really, um, you have control sort of on a granular level, but you also want the tool to be as kind of hands off for sellers as possible so that they can focus on other aspects of their business. Yeah, most definitely. So one of the really special things about our AI repricer is that there's, uh, we have a lot of sellers, especially sellers who have small teams who are new to the game, um, are leveraging the AI in order to have a set it and forget it strategy. So they can go on and work on the other parts of their business that need their attention in order to, you know, scale and succeed. But what's really what's really special about seller snap is that we also provide the opportunity for sellers to, you know, set rules that actually work in tandem with the AI to kind of break away from that if they want a little bit more control. So um, and so I think that, you know, in terms of sellers making decisions for their store, they don't have to go have blind faith in technology. They can still, you know, make intelligent decisions um, about mm -hmm. listings on a granular level. It just sounds super stressful to me. I can only imagine I'm not an Amazon seller, but I can only imagine stressing out all the time about not winning the buy box, losing out on sales. What do I need to change? Um, mm -hmm. And that, that sounds like it changes every could change every five minutes, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think that, I think that, you know, to us, both of us are not Amazon sellers. It, it could feel really stressful, but oftentimes when you, you know, we, and, but, uh, you know, as people that work in, in the business world, we also hire softwares to take care of things that we can't take care of. Right. Yeah. We hire, um, you know, in our, in our space, you know, when we're talking about, um, high tech sales and and partnerships, stuff like that. We hire CRMs or customer sure. relationship uh, management absolutely. tools to to manage you know our database of our contacts, and we hire um, we hire email clients in order to stay in in contact. Things that we wouldn't be able to do ourselves, mm -hmm. and then all the little automations that come in and make our lives easier. We have to rely on these these tools and these softwares that we decide to bring on in order to get the job done. And when you when you rely on it, and you under you understand from a high level how it works and how you might be able to manipulate those tools. Ultimately, the stress kind of the stress should go away theoretically. And if yeah. it doesn't, you probably hired the wrong tool for the job. Um, absolutely. I mean, I can't even imagine doing this just with one product, but you know, imagine somebody that's got thousands of ASINs, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of tools that they probably need. Um, and you know, you're in the repricing space, we're in the PPC automation and optimization space. Uh, yeah, both of those things absolutely nowadays would have to rely on because it's just so intricate and it happens at a lightning speed. 
Totally. You, know, you can't possibly human humanly do any of those things. Yeah. Um, you brought you brought up the new Amazon fees. Has that? Um, I know there's been so much talk about them. Um, has that affected repricing at all? Um, absolutely. Yeah. So it reflects. It has an effect on repricing in a few different ways. So you know, and you know, just to get kind of specific, there are the two main fees that we're talking about are the inbound placement fees and the uh, the low FBA inventory fee. Yeah. And the way that um, we try to think about it at Seller Snap is we we think about it as a selling fee, so a fee that is may that is charged at the time of a sale um, or overhead, right? And so mm -hmm. the the way that we can look at that is you know on a really simple basis is you know an FBA and referral fee. We don't pay those fees until we make a sale, right? Um, if you put in one item and then you have that item removed, forget that, that there might be a, re a, a removal fee, but <laughs> let's say you put in one item into FBA, you have it removed, you never sold the item, you never pay an FBA fee and you never pay a referral fee. Mm -hmm. So that's a selling fee. The overhead is everything else. So it's, you know, my, my inbound shipping, it is, um, it is my payroll, electricity, all that kind sure. of stuff. And so the and so when we're thinking about how do we support sellers when there's all these new fees, we have to understand which category do these fees fall into. And so when it comes down to the inbound placement fee, that is something that we take into account when we are in terms of an overhead fee. Why? Because no matter what, there is a cost that is an increased cost that is going to occur based off that fee. So whether I send it to, you know, four or more Amazon fulfillment centers, that's going to cost me more money if I'm with whatever carrier I choose to do so, or mm -hmm. I send it into one, one Amazon fulfillment center and Amazon charges me the placement fee. That is a fee that is, that is charged, um, as overhead. I can't do, I can't do anything about it. Should I build it into my, you know, my ROI calculations? Absolutely. But it's, we, it doesn't have anything to do with repricing. So when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about selling fees, selling fees are done at the time of, at the time of sale, right? So again, FBA referral fees, low FBA fee, uh, or low inventory FBA fee, those can be basically manipulated based off of the timing of a sale, how much I sell for and a bunch of, bunch of different indicators. So when we can't help much about you know the the overhead fees like we can't help with your with your electric bill what we can do is we can help with these selling fees so for and so just to keep it short with the low um with the low fba inventory fee we do take that into account when we're talking about our profit calculator and our auto adjust tool where we automatically change the mins and max based off of cost changes we take that into account as well so we try to take that extra step um, of thinking about, you know, mins and maxes, like mm -hmm. we spoke being a problem, um, away from the seller. So they can, fo again, focus on the things that they need to focus on. Um, so, you know, just on a very base level, uh, with these new fees that are coming, really sellers have two choices. It, they can either allow it to cut into their profit margin, or they can try to have, you know, the customer really absorb those prices. So do you see the trend moving forward as we're going to have a shift in pricing to consumers uh, to absorb all of these new Amazon fees? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know that we're going to pass these on to consumers. I think yeah. that, you know, been in the Amazon space long enough and seen multiple iterations of fee changes. Um, same thing with, and, and say even like let's let's take into account the um you know the q4 peak fulfillment fee that runs from whatever it is october 15th to january 15th amazon is taking more money from the seller to fulfill during that time and the sellers in order to keep that baseline profit margin they need to pass it on and the, i think i think last year was already the second year that they did it you know i we see that sellers are simply doing that especially using our auto adjust tool that again when the fee changes we yep. pull the new fee from the API and we adjust the min price. That's and so, perfect. and so I see that I see that people are really, really freaking out um, about all these extra fees. Right. But at the end of the day, um, you simply pass it on because mm -hmm. that's that's what every other retailer on the planet would do. <laughs> yeah, and and in every other landscape too. I mean, we see it everywhere. You know, the yep. housing industry, not just e-commerce and retail, but. So we are running up against the clock just a little bit. And just to conclude, I would ask you, what are the top 
uh, in your opinion, three things sellers can do to uh, effectively manage their repricing strategies? Top three things that sellers can do to manage their repricing strategies. The first thing is if for sellers that don't have any automation for the, for the repricing strategies, you implement one. I might have a marketing team and, and a whole lot of hate in the comments for saying this, but Amazon does provide a free one and I know it sucks, but if you're not ready to invest in it, then you can, um, if you're not ready to invest in a, in a third party repricer, okay. use something to capture buy box. Cause if you don't have buy box, you don't have sales. Okay. When we're the uh, number two is pay attention to pay attention to your margins. Um, in order to, you know, we spoke about it a lot, make sure that you have that buffer in between, you know, your cost of goods sold, your, um, and your fees in order to pay for everything else, your inbound shipping costs, the box you send it in and the postage as well. Um, mm -hmm. that's something that's super, super important. And the third part is, and this is because of, this is a, a bit, a bit personal for me, but is data and filters, filter, filter, filter. You want, we want to take a, a bird's eye view, look at each individual, you know, bucket, as we spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. um, and make choices on a medium or macro level. Don't, don't sweat the small stuff, um, on, on things that are super granular, um, because you'll be much more successful. You know, we want to, we, we know the 80, 20 rule in the, in, in selling and Amazon selling is totally in play here where um where 80 what is it 80 percent of your revenue is um done by 20 percent of your your business or of your listings mm -hmm. and so really leaning on that 20 percent of the strong yeah. part of your business um is is what we want to do in order to again move things forward and um and run successful amazon businesses uh, great advice. And that I think advice can be used by somebody just entering the marketplace or somebody that's been selling for a while. So um, really appreciate that. Uh, and just to, to conclude, um, we ask everybody since our podcast is called Adventure, um, what's the best adventure that you've had so far uh, in life? The best adventure I had in life so far is, um, you know, I am a I'm a California boy, born and bred, um, but at 23 years old, I made the choice to take a leap of faith, actually for love, following a girl to to Israel, um, and which led me on quite the adventure, living living in the Middle East. Um, you know, ended up working for SellerSnap, which has been an amazing opportunity to you know work in the Amazon seller space, um, go to conferences um, all around the world, and so um, I would say that that adventure has been uh, the best of my life. That is awesome. And it hasn't ended yet, right? It's an ongoing I'm, adventure. Absolutely not. <laughs> it's always um, an adventure. Well, it was an absolute pleasure having you um, as a guest. We learned a lot of information. I think it's going to be really insightful for a lot of people um, here listening. Uh, if you want more information, we'll have the link to Seller Snap in our show notes. So uh, make sure that you reach out, reach out to Ian and... Um, Follow us for more uh, interviews in the future. All right. Thank you for having me. Take care, Ian. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>